Hi, this is Jacob, uh, just recording a little quick intro here. Um, so, in the episode, we mention uh, the person who suggested this episode, Ian Matthew, and that you could find him at his Twitter account, uh, Ian Up North. Uh, since our recording of the episode, that account has changed. Ian Up North is no longer valid. Instead, uh, the t- the now valid Twitter account is at Ian Matthew Music. So please make sure to go and check him out there. That is that is the correct Twitter handle now. Uh, enjoy the episode. One is a tragic tale of forbidden love, murder, and betrayal, all set in Depression Era California. The other is somehow even more depressing. The Postman Always Rings Twice. They remade it. Back to another episode of They Remade It. I'm your host, Stuart. And I'm your host, Jacob. And we're here in the varying weather that I think everyone's been getting. I, I keep being like, oh, cool, it's getting kind of springish. And then today it was in the 40s. Uh, yep, same here. I mean, we're only like a couple hours away from each other. Yeah. But yeah, same here. I, uh, I wore shorts today because yesterday it was like 66 and I went outside and immediately went back inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i at least um i got up early to go to the gym with hannah and so i at least knew it was gonna be cold for the day because we walked out and we were like oh fuck <laughs> it's like <laughs> so like you know we got that going for us at least um but yeah that I, I still for whatever reason just decided i don't need a jacket going into work today um because like i was thinking like even when i got up super early in the morning it was like oh, okay it's gonna be it's cold now but it'll be fine later I know it's it stayed like about at most fifty to sixty, pretty much the whole day. I was oh. like, "Oh, this sucks." <laughs> Where's the heat? It, it, I, I, it will it'll come tomorrow or the next day, inevitably. Just good lord, this state with this weather. I hope so. The weekend's coming up. I kind of want to be outside doing things. Yeah. I got to run around tomorrow night too, so I don't want it to be too chilled. I'll be getting my COVID vaccine tomorrow, so I want it to be warm so that, you know, the microchip doesn't freeze. Oh, of course. Yes, yes. Don't break it, right, <laughs> as soon as you get it. Yeah. You need a decent, yeah, I need it to, like, settle in for a bit, then stay in a nice room temperature area, and then, you know, bat off the desire to, you know, buy Microsoft stock. Of course. Yeah. Stay away from those cell towers. This is not going to age well at all. <laughs> <laughs> We have dated ourselves so hard. <laughs> oh, whatever. It, that was a big April Fool's prank. Ha ha. Yeah. I, I mean, again, even that's dating us. I know, exactly. <laughs> we're, we are we are recording on April 1st today, which I'm, I've thankfully not seen too many things going around lately. I think people have really gotten to the point lately where it's like, fucking everything feels like a joke nowadays and it's hard to tell what's real and what's not so i think people are starting to just be a bit more tame i'm not even kidding that teletubby bitcoin thing that i shared with you with oh yeah that group earlier that's the only thing i've seen today granted i'm not like plugged into uh reddit tumblr always on twitter so there there's probably been more things going on but just in the casual social sphere that i usually encompass myself in that's it and i usually see a lot more so the only one i saw was on reddit um when things are tagged as like not safe for work the image for it is blurred and you have to click on it and the thing of it said not safe for work contains gore and you click on it it's just a picture of al gore oh so it's like okay that's that's it that's okay that's relatively (laughs) funny yeah that's 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 harmless enough Though, I mean, clicking on it should be inside, like, the words, you clicked on this expecting to see gore. Yeah, yeah, I get it. But it's one of those <laughs> things where it's, like, it's near the top of the page, and I'm like, okay, what's this? Yeah. Because, you know, normally they at least, those things don't tend to get too high on the list. 
I mean, yeah, that's true. They're isolated to specific subreddits that are often shut down. So, yeah, I I get it. God, that's weird. <laughs> oh, but besides uh, going <laughs> to the gym and getting pranked by the former vice president and inventor of the internet, what have you been doing? God, there's a there's a deep cut of nothing else. <laughs> um, um, not a whole lot in the movie front. I won't won't lie. Um, Continued with the progression of uh, Marvel movies with Hannah. We've watched through the Avengers now, which is only a couple more than where we were last time. But, you know, you can only do so many of those in a row. Um, so that, so yeah, we would have watched uh, Captain America, the first one, and then Avengers. Captain America, I think, still really holds up. Um, I think it's cool. Like, I, I wish there were more kind of extended um genres of like applied to like world war ii movies and stuff like one of them there was one um called overlord which was a horror um set in world war ii um i thought it was really creative and i thought like it really kind of took advantage of the situation pretty well and you know this being a superhero movie set in world war ii it's like it just it goes full like balls to the wall a little hammy but like still very genuine about it so it's still very well made uh, God, my fucking voice cracked there. Jesus. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I like it plenty. Um, Avengers doesn't hold up as much because, um, well, you know, um, Joss Whedon. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I just, I'm glad in more recent years, more and more stuff's been called out about him, about him just kind of being a weirdo and a creep. And because every time I see anything, any of his work, I'm just like. God, I hate this dialogue. <laughs> it's just like that constant, like, quippy, like, sarcastic talk back and forth. I'm just like, I want to, if I knew any of these people even remotely in real life, I would punch them in the mouth because they're so annoying. <laughs> um, and just so much of, like, the Avengers conflict, like, internal conflict is just people getting pissy at each other. And it's just like, man, y'all are, like, full grown adults dealing with, like, literal world shattering stuff could you maybe grow the fuck up for a sec <laughs> um so yeah that's just that one's okay yeah. the action's decent but it, like i keep i, I st even when it first came out and people were coming it's like oh this is the best thing ever there's like I, like a lot of people genuinely keep, like calling it like one of the best cinematic experiences ever i'm like y'all are fucking high like it's it's fun like yeah it's cool that they managed to pull this off but even then, it's still not that great of a movie. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's always just kind of been a touchy subject for me. And I'm just like, God, y'all just need to chill with this. It's not that brilliant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you want to hear us bash on Marvel more and just complain about it for like 35 minutes, go listen to the end of year wrap up show we did in 2019. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. Endgame had just come out. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we, we go on some long tirades. I especially go... I feel like I go pretty long on, on Marvel. <laughs> um, I go... Actually, now that I think about it, a lot of the tirades tend to be me. <laughs> I tend to I tend to not shut up. Probably. I, I think it's because when I get flustered or overly angry about something, I can't go on a tirade because my brain just, like, stops out of anger. So <laughs> I, I can't speak anymore. And I'm just like, okay, now your turn. <laughs> Which does not work enough. well when debating people. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of like that as well when it's a more serious topic. But when something is like menialism, like movies and stuff, I'm just like, yeah, no, fuck it, I'll I'll bash on this. I'm gonna bash on Ernest Klein for three hours. It's the best thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Speak it, it increases my lifespan. <laughs> oh. But yeah, uh, the the Marvel films. I'm glad you're doing that. You, uh, with you being through the Avengers, you're officially yep. caught up. I think with where I was in the timeline, uh, excluding Ant Man and Black Panther, which I watched mm. uh, after the fact. But Avengers was pretty much where I just stopped caring and just didn't watch anything after. For That's for the fair. most part, always an outlier. Honestly, I'm kind of excited for the phase two movies because i actually i think i like a lot of them a lot more than the early stuff with the exception of like iron man and captain america um 
I, yeah, I just I think the the film the, the style of film quality goes up because you know people forget like Iron Man came out in fucking two thousand seven, and so there's a lot of like kind of it, we're coming to the end of that like kind of two like weird two thousands period where things like weirdly gritty and like super kind of contemporary to the point of where it's like all right this is getting a little weird, um, so you know it, it's kind of cool as it goes for, forward. Yep. No, I I know what you mean. But other than that, not a whole lot in the way of like movies and TV shows and stuff. I briefly watched a series with my mom. I went home not too long ago. I briefly watched a series with my mom uh, about Stanley Tucci going to Italy. So that was fun. Um, <laughs> was it I, I don't just know. like it, a it, travel, like a travel yeah. lot, like that show that uh, Adam West used to have on the mm-hmm. Travel Channel? I will say yes, even though I did not know that was a thing. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's him because he's like, you know, he is Italian and everything. Um, it's just like him going to each of the, like each of the provinces or regions or whatever of Italy and just like showing the local culture. So it was like, oh, this is fun. Um, other than that, um, I and myself and Hannah have both gotten back in, have relapsed into our Skyrim addiction. So we've been binging the hell out of that, me especially. And I'm actually just like, I keep forgetting that about half the content in Skyrim, I just haven't like done because like i always go to the same paths and everything like i think this is the first like and so i decided on this run i'm going to become the most competent man in the world where i'm just going to try to level up fucking everything and go to every single location Uh let's just go full like conan the bar like original conan the barbarian where he's basically just a mary sue yeah uh now you're playing the game like i play it Ah, yes. <laughs> do it all, do everything. That being said, that's how I play most games. Skyrim, I have I've played I have started like five campaigns. I've never even beaten the main story. I usually it's not that good. give up like 60 to 70 hours in. Mm. It's really not that good, so you're not missing anything. <laughs> yeah. Um I will say though I I have this on PS4, and so it allows limited mods. So I have a a few mods to make it nicer, namely like faster leveling up. <laughs> yeah, because it's just like God using magic in that game is like pulling teeth. I'm just like God, this takes fucking forever. <laughs> but uh, that's about it. I haven't really even touched any other video games other than Skyrim. Oh, okay. That's well. God. I do not do a lot in my life. Just lay around. Eh, it's always good. What about you, though? I'm sure you've got more than me. Uh, oh. I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> well, then. <laughs> so, um, Fair. it's funny that you mentioned Ernest Klein ten minutes ago. Mm. Um, <laughs> mm, I like that noise. Uh, mm. <laughs> it's just like, it's that noise of, I don't even want to bother opening my mouth with it. I'm just like, mm. <laughs> So I watched a movie that was in part written by him. It was written by two people. I don't remember the name of the one guy, but I feel like Ernest Klein had a lot more to do with the script just because having read the three books he's written at this point and having seen that fucking movie, I think I know his writing when I see it. Um, uh, uh, but the movie is called Fanboys. Uh, and... I already hate it. It's really annoying and really bad. It's, uh, it's, it's like, so there's a group of friends, uh, that were really into star Wars and they grow up and one of them kind of grows apart and he's like, I'm still into star Wars, but I keep it a secret cause I got a job now. And one of their friends is dying of cancer and they want to, break into George Lucas's mansion to steal the master print of the Phantom Menace because so that their friend can see it because this takes place before that movie comes out as well by the way uh it's a period piece technically because it takes place like 15 years before the movie was filmed um hmm and it's just anno- it's just the characters are the worst they have the worst writing I feel like it's 
tangential to the view universe because there are what? a lot you know the kevin smith universe of oh, movies yeah um okay. <clears throat> because there's a lot of mainstays from those movies that show up in this uh including kevin smith and jason muse themselves selves for like a 10 second cameo um mm. uh, about a really tasteless uh sex joke which is nice um it's just it's just bad the writing's bad the characters are bad it's annoying it's that drivel like nerd culture that pretends to be really nerdy but doesn't know what it's talking about which is strange because i feel like ernest klein is one of those guys he's like i love what i love i know everything about it but I don't know. There's several points in this fucking movie where people are quizzed about Star Wars things to prove they're true Star Wars fans. I'll, I'll tell you right now, Stu, I've seen the movies. Um, I don't give a shit about Star Wars. <laughs> I like it. Fair. Okay. I have seen all of the movies once except for A New Hope. I think I've seen twice and Rise of Skywalker. I haven't seen at all. I just know what happens because I live on the internet. Um... And this is why I'm friends with you, man. Like, the fact that you have a baseline opinion about this stuff and not anything more or less than that is just fantastic to me. <laughs> <laughs> like, fucking, that's a, such a rare gift to find in a person. Well, thank you. That's really flattering. Um, but, so that being said, I, I give hardly a single shit about Star Wars. I like it just fine. I'm not a fanatic. I've played a couple of the video games. I've seen none of the shows, blah, blah, blah. But the questions they ask these characters, I knew the answers to almost all of them. And so I'm, I'm sitting there like, how can this be? How can this be that I know as much as these characters do about what planet Chewbacca was born on when I don't give a fuck about Chewbacca or his life? <laughs> Yeah, And I, I don't know, I have to question myself that, and that always takes me out of it. That's one of the reasons that I, I mean, besides the fact that I hate laugh tracks, and again, the characters are annoying, that's another reason why I don't like the Big Bang Theory, is because it has a lot of that writing, where it's like, well, She-Hulk could beat up Thundara, I don't know. But it, it yeah. I don't know, it's like, it's like, I don't know. This, this is what I, I was talking about earlier. I my brain fries and I lose my train of thought. <laughs> I I can hear it in your voice. I've got I've I, I've known you long enough to be able to hear that kind of like, not quite a hitch in your voice, but it's almost like, um, like you know when like, the water hammer in your house like a pipe. It's just like, in really old pipes. Every time you turn off a faucet, it just kind of you just hear a thunk in the wall. That's kind of what it feels like. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's like when I hear you stop, I'm like, I can kind of hear the thunk. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know, I know, he's not, he's not uh, happy about this. I'm, I'm glad yeah, you're I, sort of on that page. Oh yeah, don't worry. Um, yeah, I don't know how you're able to subject yourself to this stuff. I've I've wondered it for years, like how you're just able to watch these things and just like, on like to be able to watch unironically bad things because like you couldn't have expected it to be good going in with Mr. Klein himself being one of the writers. <laughs> I, um, so, yeah, I always have a low barrier for a lot of these things, and then sometimes I find something that sucks, but I, I still really like it, like Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, or, like, Night of the Lippus, or something, like, mm -hmm. movies that are shitty, but I still enjoy them, this was not one of those, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. And some, for, I don't know, it must be the Kevin Smith connection or something, because, Billy D. Williams is in this, and Carrie Fisher shows up, and they get all these Star Wars people to cameo in this fucking thing. Um, if they got Harrison Ford, I would have shit, but they didn't. I, I just I feel so bad for all those actors and everything. Other than like the only people who really didn't get kind of ruined by that movie who were part of it was like. Harrison Ford and I guess Mark Hamill since he still had voice acting. Yeah, um, he just he moved into voice acting eventually. Yeah, like obviously Alec Guinness because like fucking it's Alec Guinness. Um, 
but all the other guys they they just got locked into this fucking purgatory <laughs> um that is the star wars fucking just the star wars miasma as i think i'm going to start calling it yes um yeah just now you're known of having to show up in, like having to show up in mo- in a movie that is itself meant to be debasing itself to another movie like that's that's like a human centipede of film. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's just sad. I, I just I don't <sighs> Oh and Yeah, I don't I don't know how you're yeah, I just like I I just I hear that concept alone. I'm like it's it's appropriate that it's named fanboys. It's you know, with it being annoying and loud and in your face like a fanboy. Yeah. Um, without harping on the subject too much longer, because I just keep talking about it. Two more things I really hate. Seth Rogen plays like three characters because he's such a versatile actor. And uh, William Shatner also shows up because there's this whole side plot about how the main characters hate Star Trek fanboys and whatever. So, You know, it almost brings some quality back with the idea that William Shatner is in there because he's <laughs> such a chaotic figure in my mind that I'm like, all right, yeah, <laughs> fuck it. It's like that can't make it worse. I mean, I actually do kind of like his appearance because he's almost like a, a deep throat style figure in the shadows that like gives them materials they need to break into George Lucas's house and then he fades away. <laughs> See, that's what I mean. So... He's such an he's such a particular character in and in and of himself. That's just like, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Welcome back, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Shatner. Oh, uh... But yeah, that's the that's the only new thing I've watched. New as in I hadn't seen it before. Uh, I watched gotcha. a couple other things, but they're things that I've seen before. And uh, oh, the only other thing I was going to mention is uh, we've mentioned it on the show a couple of times, but the Magnus Archives ended last Thursday, oh, yeah. and I listened to that. So I almost forgot about it. Yeah, fully caught fully caught up on that. Kind of a boring ending, if I'm honest. Uh, yeah, I'll considering. I'll, I'll say that considering yeah. all the build, yeah, considering all the build up, <laughs> it wasn't bad objectively. It was just like, no, it was fine. Mm-hmm. I hope they do more stuff with it. They kind of opened up a big fucking can of worms with a few things, which I won't spoil, obviously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like once they open up the concept of like that particular thing that things other things could happen. Yeah, it's like. Yeah, I feel like at that point, you know, if they don't capitalize on doing more stuff with that, they're out of their minds, considering how popular it's been. You know what? That that being said, I won't. Um, I I will say, I don't even think. Yeah, I don't think it's a bad ending either. I think I thought it was boring personally, just because I saw it coming, and they they don't really give you much room. For that, because like literally three episodes prior to the end of the series, they're like, we can do this or we can do this. And then they do one of the two this is. I kind of expected it to go, you know, an alternate thing road that we had yeah. maybe had been alluded to somewhat, but hadn't really been talked about. But it was just like, OK, so this could happen or this could happen. And then one of those things happened. And I was like, OK, I they, what they a told hor- me that what could a hor- happen. <laughs> what a horribly vague way of describing something. <laughs> <laughs> this is potentially one of the worst things we could talk about of ha- like having an analysis of right now. <laughs> and I won't speak on it any further. Just I that is I listened to the whole thing. It's over now. There you go. Yeah. Quite good. <laughs> yada yada. Yes. Go listen to it. It's 200 episodes. Have fun. <laughs> um but yeah, I think that'll kind of lead us nicely into a Somewhat special, I'll say, episode, because it was a very particular user suggestion of a movie neither of us had ever fucking heard of, and yet completely caught our minds. Um, I'll talk about it more during the analysis, but I, I've heard of the film before, but I thought it was something else completely. Not even that I, I thought the plot was something different, I just got it confused with something else. So, uh... Hmm. <laughs> like the Postman? Like the Kevin Costner vehicle? Uh, no, I, I got it mixed up in my head with Death of a Salesman. Did oh, <laughs> not too dissimilar, actually. Uh, there are, yeah, there are similarities there. Yeah, there's Salesman in both. And Death. And, and you know what, that's all you need. <laughs> 
Anyway, <laughs> the postman always rings twice. Starting with the 1946 film, directed by Tay Gamet, uh, screenplay by Harry Ruskin and Niven Bush, which is a fun name, um, and based, and both these, I should say, both these movies are based on the novel of the same name from 1934 by James M. Kane. So, kicking us off, Frank Chambers, played by John Garfield, is an amiable, restless drifter who is hitched a ride with a man who we later learn is the local district attorney, Kyle Sackett, played by Leon Ames. He drops Frank off at a rural diner slash service station on a highway in the hills outside of Los Angeles. Its name is Twin Oaks. Frank ends up working there. The diner is operated by the stodgy Nick Smith, played by Cecil, Cecil Kellaway, and his beautiful, much younger wife, Cora, played by Lana Turner. Frank and Cora start to have an affair basically as soon as they meet. Cora is tired of her situation, being married to a man she does not love, and working at a diner that she wishes to own outright. During an attempt to run away together, Cora concludes that if she divorces Nick, she will end up with nothing. She and Frank then, therefore, will be no further ahead, and they have to turn around back to Twin Oaks in time for her to retrieve a goodbye note that she had left in the cash register just for Nick. Cora talks Frank into murdering Nick, because there's an escalation, in order to have them like, in order for them to own the diner outright. The plan involves Cora striking Nick with a sock full of ball bearings and pretending that he had fatally hit his head in the bathtub. Things go awry when a police officer stops by, and at the same time, a cat causes a power outage. Cora does manage to knock Nick over the head, and, while severely injuring him, he is not mortally wounded. The couple are thrilled when it's determined that Nick will be alright, since no foul place is suspected, and that he has no recollection of how he was struck. They share a happy week, week together, running the business and enjoying their relationship. The police officer stops by one day and tells Frank he passed Cora, driving Nick back from the hospital. Frank sees that there is really no hope for a definite future with her, so he decides to move on before she returns. He goes, he goes out to L.A., but after a couple of weeks, he starts hanging out around the marketplace where Nick and Cora buy most of their produce in order to get another look at her. He soon after runs into Nick, who had actually been looking for him. Nick insists that Frank return to Twin Oaks with him, saying that something important is going ha to happen tonight and you're in on it. Upon Frank's return, Cora behaves coolly towards him. The three of them have dinner together, and Nick announces that he will be selling the Twin Oaks uh, service station slash diner and that Cora and he will be moving to moving to live with his infirm sister in the town of Kuglakuk Kuglatuk Kuglatuk in northern Canada. Don't know why they insisted on including the name, that's kind of annoying. <laughs> that night Cora is desperate. Frank finds her in the kitchen with a knife that she says she was going to use on herself. Frank then agrees to kill Nick. The next day the three of them are to drive to Santa Barbara to finalize the sale of the, of the diner. Frank and Cora intend to stage a drunk driving accident. Sackett stops by for gas, and Frank and Cora stage an argument where she insists on driving due to the men's inebriation. This established that Nick is drunk, and that also, you know, Frank is at least pretending to be drunk. On a deserted stretch of road, Frank kills Nick with a blow to the back of the head, and then sends the car with him in it off of a cliff. However, Frank is caught in the car, too, and is therefore injured. Sackett, who had been following them, arrives to find Cora crying for help. The district, the district attorney files murder charges only against Cora, hoping to divide her and Frank. Although this ploy works for a moment, a clever measure by Cora's lawyer, Arthur Keats, played by Hume Cronin, prevents 
Cora's full confession from coming into the hands of the prosecutor. Cora secures a plea bargain in which she pleads guilty to manslaughter and only receives probation. Publicity from the murder makes Twin Oaks very successful, but things remain tense between Frank and Cora. <clears throat> they marry in order to protect themselves from being forced to testify against each other. When Cora leaves to take care of her sick mother, Frank has a brief fling with another woman. After Cora's return, a man named Kennedy, who had wor worked for the investigator for her attorney, who I should also say um, his name, the actor, his name is Alan Reed. Kennedy, who had worked for the investigator, uh, who had worked as an investigator for her attorney, shows up and attempts to blackmail her for the confession. Frank instead beats up Kennedy and his partner and takes the signed confession from the both of them. Cora then tells Frank that she knows about his affair. The two argue, but reconcile, and Cora announces that she's pregnant with Frank's child. She speculates that the new life that they have created may balance out the one that they had actually taken. They go to the beach and swim, realizing that they still love each other. On the way back, however, Frank accidentally crashes the car, and Cora is killed. Like you do. <laughs> Frank is tried and convicted for killing Cora. While on death row, he is visited by District Attorney Sackett once more, who confronts him with the evidence of his involvement in Nick's murder and reasons that he, if, if he, even if he resists his legal fate in Cora's death, that he'll only wind up back where he was for the conviction of Nick's murder. Frank accepts that while he is innocent of Cora's murder, his execution will be fitting punishment for his murder of Nick. Frank muses that just as the postman always rings twice, always rings a second time to make sure people receive their mail, Fate has made sure that he and Cora both finally paid the price for their crime. Now, the 1981 film is, thankfully for me, a hard remake, so it's basically identical with just a few, like a few minor differences. Um, it was, I'll go and read off the list for everybody. It was directed by Bob Raffleson. The screenplay was by David Mamet, and it was starring, in order, and I will get their names, Jack Nicholson as Frank Chambers, Jessica Lange as Cora Smith slash Papadakis, John Col Colicos as Nick Papadakis, who is now, instead of just the normal, just white dude, he is in, in fact a Greek immigrant, Michael Lerner as Mr. Katz, which I believe is Kennedy. No, sorry, that Mr. Katz, that's the lawyer. My apologies. That's, um, yeah, Cora's lawyer. Um, let's see, John P. Ryan as Kennedy, as Kennedy, Angelica Houston as Madge Gorland, the fling that he had with a lion tamer because that happens that's a whole thing um uh william Tra uh, trailer as kyle sackett and actually christopher lloyd as a brief stint as a salesman at the beginning of the film does he show back up i genuinely can't remember it was kind of hard to remember i do end. not believe so no okay cool <laughs> um yeah that will be your lot the only major differences like i said will is um, there's a circus <laughs> <laughs> there was a circus briefly, like it came out of nowhere. First of all, um, I was like, "What the?" Fuck? You know, like I said, Nick instead of Nick Smith, it's Nick Papadakis, which he, he's a uh, Greek man instead, and um, it's also a lot more violent, like a lot more violent, way more violent. And you know, the ending is different in that it, it's essentially the yes. same, but it cuts off right after her death. There's not even any mention of, you know, the postman always rings twice sort of deal. So if if you haven't read the book or seen any of the other adaptations, you're like, fuck all if I know why it's called that. Because, <laughs> like, that's not a thing that people do anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I didn't even know that was a thing to begin with. It's like, fucking if the postman knocked twice on my fucking door, he'd have to come up three flights. Half the time, I'm pretty sure that the postman pretends to knock on my door. Because I sit on the couch right next to it, and then he just leaves, you know, a, one of those door hangers on the door that says, come by the post office. You know, because yeah. he's a dick. But. Modern problems. <laughs> for, for modern douchebags. <laughs> Don't even get me started on the milkman and how he's been screwing me over. Anyways. I'm screwing. I, I was gonna make a screwing your wife joke I, as well. Yeah. But I, <laughs> it's like, I was like, you know what, that's that's. Both tasteless and boring somehow. Trying to find a way in there, sneak it in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not, not unlike the milkman. There you go. There you go. <laughs> That's it. That's what I was Booyah! Yeah, sure. let's get to full fucking circle. I'm on a roll. <laughs> oh, speaking of, finally a nice segue on this godforsaken show.
Okay, so they are a little spread out this time, and kind of all over the place, uh, with only one Ooh. real recognizable name for me. Um, so, I'm going to start with the 81 version uh, for a specific reason. But uh, So, the most obvious okay. one is Jack Nicholson, who was Frank Chambers in the 81 Postman Always Rings Twice. Uh, we've seen him before as Wilbur Force in 1960's Little Shop of Horrors. And yep. he was Frank Costello in our beloved The Departed. Um, Which it doesn't technically count for the bingo list because it was part of Full Circle. Yes, it, it's a fact. This is factual statement time. Yes, uh, we didn't just kind of go off on it this time. Uh, the, next the, night is, the night is obviously young, but still. We will see what happens from here. Um, next, we have Brian James, Brian James, B R I O N. Don't. I'll just say Brian, I guess. Brian James as a crapshooter in 81's Postman. And uh, he was Leon Kowalski in the 1982 Blade Runner. Which, oh. that's a full. Oh. Yeah. Well, I'll be fucked. There you go, an actual character. Don't worry, we'll wow. we'll get we'll get get away from actual characters here soon. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, lastly, for the eighty-one postman, we have William Newman, who in Postman was the man from hometown, who, if you remember, is the one who tells Cora uh, that her mother has passed away. He's like, Ah, you don't remember me, but I remember you. That was William Newman. Yep. Yeah, okay, I, that character skewed me out so much. I was like, "This is this just going to be, like, a secondary murderer character now? Like, what the hell is this? This is, like, this is serial killer behavior. It was kind of creepy and a little unnecessary, but this is not the first time we've seen this man because William Newman also played Sheriff Cronin in 1993's Leprechaun. What the fuck? So, <laughs> that's, I think that might be our first full circle connection to leprechaun uh wow which is that, nice wow okay fair enough oh now we will move on to the uh 1946 postman we have two so okay lord help me i do not know how to pronounce this name hume cronin hume cronian <laughs> Sp- uh, spell the f- oh uh i may have actually said that before H-U-M-E. Oh, Hume. It's, it's just Hume. Yeah, it's just Hume. Hume. Hume Cronin. Yeah. Hume Cronin. There we go. That took 20 seconds. <laughs> Hume Cronin played Arthur Keats in The Postman Always Rings Twice, 1946. And he was also Rupert Horn in 1985's Brewster's Millions. Oh my god, that's where I fucking know yep. from. <laughs> I kept seeing his face. I was like, I know this guy. I know this guy. Where do I know this guy? Oh, and finally, there's also no got a fantastic name in the in the in the movie Arthur Keats. It's like God, that's a kick-ass name. It is. But speaking of fantastic names, this guy not familiar in the slightest, mainly because he's just showed up in old film, old black and white features we've watched in uncredited roles. Um, <laughs> but I love this name. His name is King Baggett. Oh my God! <laughs> I want to be his friend. <laughs> He is probably deceased. He's probably dead. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Baggett, you said? Yes. King Baggett played God. a courtroom spectator in 46's Postman, and he was uncredited as a department head in 1932's What Price Hollywood. Wow. I want to know his life. <laughs> Give me his his fucking life story. Where is the biography on King Baggett, please? Yeah, we get all this weird crap. We get like all this stuff like Lady Gaga and all this other shit and like Madonna and all this stuff. No. Give us King. Is he actually royalty? And if so, where from? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> God, that's a fantastic name. Oh but... I'm gonna name my I'm gonna name my next pet King. Oh, uh, I'll name my next pet Baggett. Hell yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, but that's uh, it for Full Circle. Cool. So, where would you... Oh, and I would also I should also say we should probably go ahead and mention the name of the person who actually suggested this, because it actually tickled oh. us to no end that we got a very direct, you know, um, 
suggestion for this one, and for one that we were both very surprised by, I'm sure I yeah. can say for both of us. No, we've gotten some lists before on social media sites and through email, but this is the first one that was just like, uh, you should do this one. And also I was like, what? It, what? This is not what I was expecting someone to suggest. It's like, oh, you guys should do um, the Bicentennial Man. It's like, okay. <laughs> um, but yes, his is name... Is uh, I, I don't know. I was just pulling something out of nowhere. Um, oh, okay. His name is Ian Matthew. You can find him in, at Ian Up North on Twitter. He is a, he's a singer. He's a composer. He he does a lot of original stuff. I, I, I actually follow him on Twitter now. So, yeah, you can uh, go ahead and check him out there at Ian Up North. Thank you very much for the suggestion. Uh, Class act, dude. Thank you. Yeah, Seriously. He's making some good beats over there, too. Yeah. We got a really cool episode out of it, or at least an interesting episode that, like, has the rare occasion of having Jack Nicholson in a leading role, which I honestly don't know a lot of movies where he is, but I will have points to say about that in a minute. Yeah. But, um... I mean, the only other one... Yeah, could... I'll go ahead and... Yeah. What's that? Uh, I... Yeah, you. sorry, you go and oh. finish your thought. I need to get a drink of water because I'm about to die. <laughs> That's okay. I was just going to say, I'm sure there's a decent amount where he has a lead role, obviously. He's such a big name actor. But the only one I can think of right now is that movie I can't remember the name of, where he has like Asperger's or something. Oh, Chinatown 2. There's the dog, and I can't remember the name of it. Oh, whatever. Who cares? I was going to say The Shining, technically. The Shining too, yeah. What a, uh, uh, about Schmidt? I think. Um, you you have already known way more than I knew. <laughs> I think he played the son on the poster for One Crazy Summer. Um, huh. <laughs> I mean, we know his his quintessential role is obviously you know uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Yes, of course, that's the one that everyone sort of knows. Yes. <laughs> Anyways, I guess I will start saying my piece. Um, yes, please. Even though I think you've had a decent enough break from the plot at this point. <laughs> we've rambled oh, well, yeah, on for that's, so long. We've been rambling on a bit, yeah. But, but I'll, I, I'll still like, Even at that point. Yeah, even at that point, I still hadn't had a drink of water, so I was like, oh, God. It's tradition. Like I sort of said before the plot synopsis, uh, when we first got the suggestion, the first thing that popped into my head was Death of a Salesman. Uh, and it, it, I don't know. It was just the, hearing it, and I was like, oh, Death of a Salesman. That's, uh, wh- is he talking about the one with Dustin Hoffman or or what? Um, and know that it, obviously that is not uh, any of the numerous films based on the Arthur Miller play of the same name. This is, this was completely different. Um, much more violent than I expected. Uh, oh, I mean, yeah. the 81 version, obviously very egregious in terms of violence and like, I would say bordering on sexual violence. So it's, I, mean, yeah, I think that still counts. As yeah, sexual it's very, violence. exactly. That's why I'm trying yeah. to tread the line there. But, um, yeah, I, think f- we're, I think we're definitely within our grounds to say like, yeah, no, that's kind of rapey. Okay. It's pretty rapey. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's not absurd to say. <laughs> but also that being said, the 46 one doesn't have a lot of that you know the sexual stuff in there but it's a lot yeah. more violent than i expected from a film from a 46 film too yeah and apparently the book itself actually goes into more detail like i say detail but it definitely does bring up like more sexual violence apparently like i i had seen a few like contemporary reviews of the 46 film where it's like they talk about like the movie alludes to the kind of more sexual events that occur in the book Mm -hmm. um so it's definitely like even then like the book was from 1934 so it's like holy shit yeah um like it's weird like obviously it's like we get right down to it a lot of these movies always paint a rosier picture of how things were back then but it's like pretty much all the same shit that happens now happened then it's just not everyone wanted to talk about it right yeah um so so i think the first thing that i want to touch on is the ending of the movies. Um, mm, that's appropriate. <laughs> just because it, it's what stands out in my mind the most, and instantly, it, one of those things where... So, 
I'm I did not I don't have a consensus coming into this. I'm hoping I'll have a consensus near the end uh after discussing it with you. But the one thing I'll say is that upon seeing the ending of the 81 version, I was like I like that ending better. Uh yeah. I much prefer it because it, it, it's one of those things where, you know, this is an awful fucking person. Uh and <laughs> she she was, it was an awful fucking person too. And yeah. she dies and, you know, he sort of weeps over her body because they had just reconciled. They're, they want to have a kid together. You know, they're going to start their life. And she's dead, and now he has to live with it, and that's the end. I much prefer that ending to, you know, she dies, and then, you know, there's this whole thing where he gets pulled back in. Like you were saying in the synopsis, not, none of that stuff in the 46 version about, you know, we found the note in the register, you know, if... if if you didn't kill her, we'll still get you back in here for killing him. And, you know, he, he sort of comes to peace and he's, like, happy for as happy as you can be in that situation because he's like, you know, I would much rather die for having plotted with her to kill him than for falsely dying for having killed her, which I didn't do, or whatever. Uh, yeah. It, you know, the fact that, you know... He's in that situation, and you know he's going to die, but he sort of gets a happy ending. I'm not all in for because he sucks. But also, yeah. it's it, as soon as he gives that little speech about, you know, what the title of the movie is, it just ends, which is such... We've mentioned on the show before, but such a thing with movies of that time. Uh, you can even see it in fucking Looney Tunes cartoons, where it's like, uh, we don't know how to end this, so that's the end. Yeah, I mean that's where like fucking riding into the sunset came from, where they're just like fuck it, we don't know what to, we don't we don't know how to end this. Let's just have the main actor just fucks off and leaves. Yeah, what's a good <laughs> ending? Yeah, I so they know. had to come up with something. Yeah, but it's I, just, I it's not like I expected them to show him getting ha- hanged in the movie or anything like that. You know, I'm not stupid, but it, it still it's just like oh, uh, postman always rings twice. Blah blah blah. And then end credits. Yeah. Subtlety was like still kind of a, a non-explored art at the time. <laughs> um, I will say, though, I can't really say I like one or ending or the other more or less. Because, like, I think for the tone of film each one was creating in the end, I think each ending was appropriate. Because, um, like, the 46 one, it kind of goes into the point of it has extended periods where there's like, if there are time skips or there's like just a, a period of time when Frank leaves or like, you know, has one of his moments where he like tries to leave, but he gets drawn back in and he'll narrate over to kind of give some further details, which I actually quite appreciated. Cause it actually like, you know, it moved, it didn't drag out moments like that, which I actually very like in this movie. It's like, okay, no, it just kind of, it keeps it at a pretty decent pace. Um, even at times where it just has to literally like narrate over it, but I don't think that's a necessarily bad thing. I think it was done fine. Um, but we get a deeper glimpse into Frank as a character and as a person and the 46 one a lot. So like, well, he is still a pretty much a piece of shit when you get down to it. He's at least a one with depth. And it's like at the end with his, you know, revelation of him, you know, like reconciling and kind of you know coming to terms with his fate that you know he's at least got some level of maybe i guess uh, like i say like essentially spiritual uh, ending with it but like he literally talks about like talking to god and all this stuff it's like okay yeah that's it, it was pretty spiritual it was very religious um but i definitely think it lends itself that ending lends itself more to the character they were um my alarm just went off for some reason um uh, I just completely lost my track. Hang on. Um, yeah, sorry. I'll I'll, I'll, start, uh, yeah, I'll go and do it again. <clears throat> but I definitely think it lends itself more to the style they were leading towards in that movie. Where, you know, obviously it does the usual, like, ham-handed lesson, at, like, whatever. Um, whereas, you know, the 81 one was definitely meant to be very harsh and very cruel and like you know frank as a person is truly pretty irredeemable and that this ending really was just meant to be like 
this is a terrible person receiving a just punishment against him. And and that's kind of all you need to see. So it's like in that case, it's like, oh, it's kind of almost cathartic to see happen versus, you know, if it were like a character that we had actually, I'm sure, like purposefully grown to have some level of attachment to more than just like, wow, God, I hate him. (laughs) So I think I definitely think they each have an appropriate ending. And I couldn't really tell you which one I said was I could say is better or worse. Yeah, no, I I get that. I I think I think mine is more so preference because I think you're right thematically and how the characters are set up. You know, one works better one way, one works better the other way. I I, I think I just like the more you know pin pinned on it because because even even with the way the character set up in the forty six version, it felt like an unnecessary tack on to me, but. Uh, Perhaps that's because even with all of his, um, even with all the dialogue and the attempts to get to know the character, I never really felt any connection with it. Which is strange to say because it's not like I felt any connection with Jack Nicholson's character either. You know, right. like you said, he's irredeemable. But I guess that ending comes more into play. Where I don't know. I I feel like. Part of it was a character beat, but I, it almost felt like there was some sort of reaching for some sympathy in the 46 one to some degree. Yeah, it, it definitely felt like it at times. Um, and that's like, I don't know what I was trying to say. I necessarily like liked Nick as a person. Like, I just think it did a better job of establishing this is more than just a form of archetype or something or just some sort of vessel that we're supposed to watch these terrible events unfold from. It at least tried to kind of be like, oh, he actually has a bit of a personality going on and that he's actually kind of charming and actually has some genuine suave to what he's be able to do. And he isn't just a literal crook like Jack Nicholson's character. Like yeah. He's not great, obviously. He's he's done a few. He did a few skewy things throughout the movie, but he, it was nothing I could say was wholly evil or anything or outright horrible. He was just kind of a dick. Yeah. And they, they, I mean, they go out of their way to make Jack Nicholson's portrayal worse in so many different Mm -hmm. ways. Just what you're shown and then even what you're told, because they pin a lot more on him. Like, you're wanted for this here, you're wanted for this there, you know. Yeah. Which, like, I feel like at a certain point, they were just kind of piling it up. It's like, all right, fine, we get it. This guy's a bastard. (laughs) Jesus. Like, you did not need to convince me of all that, all this stuff. Yeah. And I think, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if there's a genuine analysis of the 81 version. Because, like, I even had this kind of the thought partway through, because I had the idea of, um, like, because, like, there's this whole recurring thing where Frank tries to leave or he tries to get out of the situation, but either he's, he even when he gets out, he gets dragged back in, either through his own actions or the actions of another. Um, I was reminded of, like, I think it's the play No Exit in which the characters are in hell and mm-hmm. can't leave the room right. that they're in. Um, I would not be surprised if there is a genuine analysis that the 1981 version is just a, it's just a vision of these people literally in hell. Cause I don't think there's a single character in that movie. That's not like kind of a piece of shit. Like <laughs> I think everyone in that, like even the, like the 46 one, it had like a few people who were like, okay. Like, even the like the district attorney, like he was the closest thing to a stand up guy in the whole thing versus like that dumb cop. Because yeah. it's like, yeah, he yeah, he wasn't great, but he also was smart and he was able to tell, hey, these people are fucking murderers. <laughs> it's like he was being skeevy, but he was being skeevy to murderers. So like it's not that bad. <laughs> um whereas like the lawyer had the whole thing of like pretending like he brought in his assistant pretending to be an assistant to the district attorney to get the confession. Then that assistant blackmailed them and all this other shit. It's like, but at least there's some complexity. But everyone in the 81 version, just like complete shit. Even the district attorney, he was kind of an asshole. Yeah. Yeah, no. Like no real redemption arc for him or anything with it. He was just like, no, I'm just a dick about what I do. And then every other character, like, you know, Nick Papadakis was... Like, even more of a shit heel than, you know, Nick in the original. Yeah. 
which is impressive, honestly. I, I mean, what you said, there has to be an analysis. There has to be multiple analyses on the that adaptation online or just in the zeitgeist, just, just for the sole fact that this is the debut, the screenplay debut of David Mamet. I mean, come on. Oh, the yeah. Untouchables, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, uh, Hoffa, uh, that movie, that one movie with Robert De Niro, I think, where they stage a war. Oh, I, I know what you're talking about. Called. But yeah, so I mean... He's one of those prolific guys where film teachers are are like, yeah, uh, we're studying this today. So there's probably endless amounts of analyses, and I, I should have bothered to look one up. Dang. I mean, like, part of it is, like, I can't imagine it's a very hard, you know, like, analysis. Because <laughs> it's like, you know, like I said, even just with my limited experience, it's like, oh, yeah, no, this this feels like an allegory to hell. Like I feel like that 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 is a very easy connection to make. <laughs> yeah, um, I think especially that like he was in oh, a coma the whole time. I think he was Nick. <laughs> He's the one who hit his head. Um, and this is all his unresolved, really creepy sexual thoughts about his wife. Ugh. Ugh. God, yeah, it's just it, it, it's it, yeah, it's like it's difficult not to think about. Frank as a character in 81 as anything other than a bastard just because of all the weird, creepy shit he does. Like, he isn't even that nice to Cora, really. Like, yeah, I know, like, the 46 one, he's not nice or all that nice to her either, but at least it seemed like they already had a lot of very nice moments together versus, like, 81, they just kind of had a few moments where they fucked, and then otherwise Frank just hit her. (laughs) And then raped her in a few occasions. Yeah, I... Um... It's like, it's just hard to think of it other than just, like, scum at that point. Can we it's s- like, God. Can we just say that Jack Nicholson is really good at playing just shit heels too? Yeah, and that's kind of what... It, yeah, that is definitely what I was leading into as well. It's like, God, I don't like Jack Nicholson in a lead role. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like, I... I I know movies can have evil characters and bad characters as the main role and make them compelling. I mean, hell, we saw the original Scarface. It did that really well. Um, but it's just with Jack Nicholson, he's just like so to the wall with being a shit heel that it's just like, man, I really just don't enjoy watching this because I'm just uncomfortable. <laughs> so like that scene in the 81 version where Jack Nicholson is making out with um, Jessica Lang in, like, the yeah. kitchen. And meanwhile, Nick is upstairs calling for her. And so she she leaves and starts to go upstairs. And it cuts to, it cuts to Jack Nicholson at the bottom of the stairs looking up at her with, a, like, a, almost a scowl and just these dead <laughs> eyes. And you could literally take that out of... You could just take that scene that view of nicholson and just cut it out and i guarantee you a lot of people would just assume it's from the third act of the shining because it looks exactly <laughs> like yeah i was kidding. any of I was, those there dead few stairs moments. yeah he does he does the dead stare thing super well to the point of where it's like i think he might just be kind of crazy which like the more i see about him in his actual life i'm like i think he actually is <laughs> the dude's the dude's a maniac. Yeah, like it's just that very unique. Like he seems like a char- He seems like a guy who should have been in very early film, but he got dropped into like the seventies and the eighties, and therefore just got immediately addicted to like like cocaine and everything. Yeah, <laughs> and so it's like wow, <laughs> that's that's what happens. Well, I mean, he yeah. he was one of those core. He 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 was used a lot by Roger Corman, as we saw in the Little Shop of Horrors. And yeah, um, good point. I I mean, a lot of the people Roger Corman worked with in the '60s did end up moving on to bigger, bigger, and better things. But they also got put through that Roger Corman ringer of making films, where it's like, okay, uh, we're gonna film for twelve hours today. We have absolutely no budget. I'm going to teach you how to make it look like it's night when it's daytime by using these weird collective hats. It's like he he was a maniac himself. 
So <laughs> I feel like that got yeah. imbued in a lot of the people he worked with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he definitely worked on some crazy different things when you get right down to it, Ham. It's yeah, I'm sure it hasn't been great on his psyche in the long term. <laughs> Corman is but to blame. This... <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um but at this stage, I'd like to shift gear a little bit for characters. What do you think of the Koras of both of these movies? Because I actually have a bit more of a complex opinion about them. Um, Because, like, obviously we can shit on Jack Nicholson all day. Which, like, I'm not, I can't even say I'm shitting on him. He definitely plays a bastard in 81 very well. It's just that, like, it's so good that I'm like, I genuinely just hate this character. So, but, Whereas Korra actually has some... Shall we say, I can't quite say depth necessarily, but it's definitely different. <laughs> so. Okay, a bit of depth. I won't be I'm, I'm willing to discuss this in deeper depth and sort of figure it out. Because if, if we're talking about the Koras, I, I prefer Lana Turner as Korra as opposed to Jessica hmm. Lange. And I don't know why. Hmm. I think maybe it's because... They're both they're both bad. They're supposed to be they're supposed to be bad characters because they're also in on this, you know, murder plot. But I think Lon, I think that Lana Turner juxtaposed with um John Garfield as Frank, you mm-hmm. get to see her be more bad and more of an evil sort of bastard character, but Jessica Lang next to, you know, Jack Nicholson She's still doing bad things, but it's like, oh my god, Jack Nicholson is horrible. So I don't think she, I don't think a lot of that gets to shine as much because I'm too focused on him. <laughs> yeah, and like I kind of, I kind of get that. Um, see, but like if we're in, I think in that same vein though, I think the reasons you like one, dislike the other, it's the exact reason why I have the exact opposite. Um, because. I think I, I just completely forgot lost her name uh, in the original Lana um, Turner. Lana Turner, thank you. I think Lana Turner. I think she's fine, but I think also at the same time, this being like a classic noir film, she really just kind of feels like a relatively stock standard femme fatale. Definitely more agency than like she's a combination of like the like the love interest and the femme fatale, which is you know different than usual. Um, but it, it's pretty straightforward, you know, kind of very devious, like a more devious mind and that sort of thing. Like just trying to get kind of get her way. Whereas um, with Jessica Lange, I actually like with seeing Jack Nicholson just being his usual bastard self. And I just kind of started paying attention more to Jessica Lange because I was just like, I just want to pay less attention to Jack Nicholson because I'm generally just getting uncomfortable. <laughs> um, paying attention to her with it, it genuinely kind of builds. And I wish they capitalized on it more. It genuinely kind of builds up Cora char- char- Cora's character as being like a literal psychopath. Like, yeah, Cora Smith in the original, she's, you know, this kind of, she just seems like a shitty person and just like wants to like make something of her life and everything. But like, there's a few moments where, where um, you know, when, um, when Jessica Lange's character is the first one to bring up the idea of killing Nick. And you can just, like, see it in her face. Like, she's standing in the rain and how genuinely just, like, cold she seems. Where she's just kind of, like, almost like uh, almost chuckling about the idea of killing her, mm-hmm. uh, killing him. And I'm just looking at her. I'm like, oh, my. F- holy crap. <laughs> like, this is a genuinely scary character now. And it's g- honestly really compelling, like, whenever I noticed it. Where it's like, this is a person who is genuinely seems like she's having a psychotic break with this whole situation where it's you know you know with um lana turner having it's like oh she's in a crap situation and she pictured herself better but jessica lang genuinely feels like she's trapped and is like willing is like wanting this rather than feeling like it's what she has to do to have a life Mm -hmm. where it's like just all these different moments where there's a moment in the 81 version where Instead of the the tipping point to actually tr- like to try to kill Nick in earnest, rather than moving away, it's Nick now that he's um, out of the hospital, like wants to have a baby with Jessica Lang's character. Oh yeah, and she and just like how 
deeply like traumatized she is by the idea. It's like that alone. It's like get right down to it. Nick is isn't great, and he's kind of a bum, but he's not that horrible comparatively, at least compared to the fucking Frank. Mm-hmm. Um, but just like how just like cold and like down this like mental pit it looks like you know Jessica Lange's character has gone to it's like holy crap I want to see where this goes because <laughs> it's like I, I just I genuinely was like I wish it had more centered on her like if she had just been oh, much the main that. character for, it would have been crazy just seeing her kind of go through this whole situation but it's like wow it just it, it was honestly kind of creepy and I actually really loved it. it was, she was honestly like the, one of the highlights of the film for me. So so here's the thing. Um that scene uh, what I'm about to say may sound unfair in some ways, but eh, that's the way it goes. That scene with her yeah. like <laughs> sobbing over that that may be my favorite scene in the movie and Frank is there but he's sort of in the background because it's all on her emotionally and it's so yeah. powerful. And it, it comes maybe halfway through the movie um, as well. Mm-hmm. So we've kind of had <laughs> distant. I cannot stress enough how much the beginning of the movie, Frank's assault, like, had me completely focused on the Nicholson character. So I think a lot of stuff that Jessica Lang was doing at the beginning was completely overwritten because like you said, you just couldn't look at him anymore. I couldn't turn away. I was like, what the <laughs> fuck am I watching? There is a scene. There is a scene where they're in the kitchen and she's like in the oven or something. And he, he doesn't slap her ass. He punches it. He has a whole bald fist and he punches her ass. And I was like, what in the what the fuck so i think i think a lot of those early jessica lang moments got overwritten in my mind because i just couldn't focus on her but by the time we get about halfway through that started to leave my mind so i can i can see more of her performances which i think is another reason why that scene uh following her and nick discussing well not really discussing him talking um about having a child why that that actually did resonate with me um as opposed to the scene where she's talking about killing him again i completely forgot any like smiling or laughing all i remember about that scene was when it cuts back to nicholson and he's looking at her dead and he goes they hanged people they hang people for that yeah yeah i I, (laughs) kind of remember that as well i was just like yeah god it's like how can one guy be like simultaneously so crazy on screen, but also like simultaneously kind of dull because he's done it so much, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I guess again, lends itself to him just playing very skeevy characters, which I'm beginning to realize. I think I, I like, I imagine like that scene where he punches her and everything. I think Jack Nicholson's just an asshole. He might like, be. I think he probably, I think he's probably just horrible to work with. That's something it's else like, I should I, look into. I don't think I've ever heard any any set stories like that, but that might be uh, something for me to look the, up. The most I've ever heard about the man is that he did a ton of drugs and he has apparently fucked everybody. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to live. That is like, I mean, yeah, like, holy Jesus. Like, if that's the way you're going to do it, I guess, like, I guess fair play. But holy crap. Yeah. Oh, uh, but, <laughs> but. Yeah, like, even, but yeah, even in that scene where she talked about killing him, it's like, it's just like it's very subtle like facial movements and everything that she's doing it just genuinely is like oh this lady's actually losing her mind and that's terrifying (laughs) oh i i need to see it again i wonder if uh if movie clips on youtube has that (laughs) that scene um so going back briefly to the 46 version this is extremely minor and has barely anything to do with anything but I can't. Hmm. I cannot watch Alan Reed in things because I just hear Fred Flintstone. Do you have that problem? Oh my fucking god! That's where I know his voice. I have. Oh so my much god! Trouble. I knew it was something. I have that. Problem I, I kept so looking lot. at him. I. I kept looking at him. And I kept thinking. Is that the guy from Sopranos? <laughs> Back in the forties. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess exactly. That's why I was so good. Con- but... Well, exactly. But I can't, every time I looked at him, I couldn't help it. I was like, 
this is the main character from the Sopranos. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like not even a joke. <laughs> it's like, I was so confused. I just kept get, I couldn't get, that probably took up my mind more than his voice. Cause it's like thinking back on it. I'm like, Oh yeah. Fuck. <laughs> I didn't even realize. It's one of those things where it's the same thing with Jonathan Harris, where it's not like he's a voice actor that has such a, you know, a big wide range of voices, but I grew up hearing his voice in cartoons before I any ever saw any of his live action stuff, and now it's just distracting. <laughs> so it, yeah. it's the same thing for Alan Reed. That was just something that I wanted to get your get your thoughts on because it, it, that really does take, and that's not the movie's fault, but that really does take me out of the movie whenever stuff like that happens. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, on it, like I mean, like I said, I hadn't, I didn't even realize it, but I think just at the time I was distracted. I also haven't watched the Flintstones in so long, so. Oh yeah, that that'll do. You it definitely too. have a. You definitely have a better mental lexicon of voices and everything. That's for sure. But it's like I'm sure if I went back and listened to it, I'd be like, oh god damn it, it is him. <laughs> it's just because animation's my strong suit, I guess. Animation and horror, but. uh my mine is apparently associations with you know 1990s or 2000s Italian crime shows. <laughs> yes, that's your strong. Suit. Well, Italian Italian American, I guess I should say. Yes. Um. Oh, I, there was. Now I feel stupid. There was another thought I had about the 46 one that I'm quick fill the air while I think. <laughs> Did you have another <laughs> point? I had something I wanted to bring up. I mean, not extent, not to any kind of extensive degree. I definitely, um, I definitely liked, like I said, I definitely enjoyed the pacing and everything more in the forty six one, just because I think it, God, because God, this is a roller coaster of a plot. I keep just thinking back on it. It's like fucking hell. This is a lot going on. Like the murdering Nick thing. That's at like the halfway point. Um, just with like the drama that they end up going through. Mm-hmm. Um. And I just, I, like I said, I definitely like the pacing more in the 46 one just because I think they just do more with what they're given. Whereas in the just 81, it's just more chances for Nicholson to either eat the scenery or, you know, eat Jessica Lang. Uh. <clears throat> but, yeah. <laughs> <Hey-o>. um, <laughs> so I'm, again, I'm on a roll tonight. Um, but, yeah, it's it was easier to... It, I, on the surface, the 46 one should have bored me to tears because it's like it's the same kind of, you know, usual 1940s to 50s films of very ham handed in a lot of ways. A lot of the acting can be kind of subpar at times. But for whatever reason, I was just engaged the entire time. Like it was compelling. Like I genuinely wanted to see how the story was going. Mm-hmm. And I can never tell. And I needed to start watching the remakes before the originals because I don't know if. The 81 just slipped through my mind so quickly. And I was just like, oh, yeah, that's that's that. Or just, or even rather that it just didn't stick around that much in my mind. And I can't tell it's just because I already knew the plot back to forward. Or if it's because um, just the characterization wasn't as good. Like, I know even then, like the 46 one, the character characterization wasn't incredible. But at least it was something. It's like you get right down to it. It's like unless you're assuming to watch this as like a vis- literal vision of hell, I feel like there isn't any reason to continue watching these characters go through their lives because it's like they do everything in their power to just be like, nah, I don't want to watch them anymore. They're they're just bad people. They're doing bad things and they're gonna end up having bad consequences. <laughs> they're cruel. I don't like it because they are cruel. Yeah. It's like he goes on this like you know he like he runs off and goes on this affair with this lion tamer lady, which like again, what the fuck was up with the whole lion lion taming thing? I I um, do not that, know that showed up and that just got my attention immediately because that that guy shows up and he's like I got cats in the back and I was like okay that's strange and then it cuts to like yeah. him petting I guess it's a lion it looked like a bobcat or a puma or something I was like what the fuck what is this? Yeah, it's it's just it's because like it should be said like you know it briefly goes over it in the original, the affair that Frank goes on with this other random woman, it's like this other woman has one screen has like one scene, and then she's gone and then it just gets brought up again later with evidence, 
it's like very brief and they're just like oh you know it's just you know frank being you know the suave dickhead again but 81 one just like goes out of its way to have this whole thing of a being a lion tamer and all this other shit it's like could have just picked up some random woman why was this necessary? <laughs> what is the point of this? It's so weird. Maybe that's in the original book. The more I think about it. Maybe maybe the whole circus thing was in the original book and in, in the 46 one when they were adapting it. They were like, what the fuck? We're not, we're not doing that. We're not getting live wild animals. I don't think they even really, I, I, they barely show them on screen for the 81 version as well. Yeah. Um, so like it wasn't even worth it. Like they should have just been in that version. Just also should have been like this is stupid. Let's just have a, something more basic. Um, like the- just some woman just comes to the service station just needing a f- fix up, and he's just like, oh, you know, I'll fuck this woman. That that being <laughs> said, this may um, this is more of a logical question about the universe of the movie. So maybe you can or cannot answer it. But are is it to be believed that? when the circus lady stops back by the house and meets up with Cora, that she leaves behind a bobcat for Frank to then find in their bed? Is that not what happened? I saw that and I was like, wait, what is going on? And then Cora's there, so she knows there's like this big cat in their bed. Did I dream that? I really... I don't, I don't know, because, like, God, now I'm having a hard time remembering that. Because, like, I know what you're talking about, but it's, like, it's just kind of there in my mind. God, I must have zoned out. I could have swore like, that was I the evidence, gotten... and I didn't, like, rewind it or pause it or anything. It just kept going, and I was, I was like, trying to rationalize with myself. I was like, okay, so the circus lady realizes that he is, like, married or dating or whatever the fuck they are, and... So she's like, I will leave behind a cat, watch it, because I swear that's what happened. Yeah, I I honestly don't know. I'm so confused. What is this whole what is this the whole thing? I don't know anymore, man. This is such a weird movie. Uh, <laughs> oh my god, I kinda like God, that scene alone elevates the whole movie for me, honestly, because I'm like, <laughs> alright. Screw it! <laughs> Extra two <laughs> points guess. off the get go. Which which circle of hell is this? It's just the of non the circle of non sequiturs. <laughs> oh my god! It's like this is the, the this is the layer between lust and and gluttony. It's like lions. <laughs> it's, oh my god! It's so weird, and I kind of love it. <laughs> Speaking of. Uh, well, not speaking of, moving on, um, I yeah. remembered what I had been thinking about before you brought up the, the bit about all that clown shoes nonsense. Um, <laughs> and that being that we, we've discussed this before when we've had black and white films compared to, you know, more modern films that uh, happen to have the luxury of color. But the fact that this is in black and white and the fact that it's, you know, sort of a noir, a noir you know, it's playing on some of those. Uh, well, I mean, I think it, I think it just objectively is a noir. Um, it uses lighting so well, and that's the first thing I always notice with films like this because they they all the colors are grayscaled, so they have to use it to the best of their abilities. And yeah. it's it's rare that I see a black and white film like that that doesn't have good lighting, but this one especially, and I noticed it immediately. Um, And the only reason I bring it up in this case is because there are several scenes in the 81 version where I cannot see what's going on. And I don't know what's going on. Um, It's just too dark. Like whenever they're walking upstairs or they're in the stairwell, the nighttime driving scene uh, a couple of the scenes were, if I hadn't watched the 46 one first, I would not know what's going on. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so just things like that, I think, made it more noticeable. But the, yeah. props to the 46 I think there, one for that. Yeah, because, like, there's even a lot of the scenes, they're shot outside. Like, 
like just filming outdoors in the 40s and 50s that was no easy task especially for lighting it's like the fact that it all like looked so concise and everything looked so crisp and everything is honestly really impressive <laughs> which like i wonder if the lighting engineer is on the wiki page or anything um, let's give him a quick shout out I mean, the cinematography was Sidney Wag- Wagner, so I'll say that at least. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the 81 definitely kind of went a bit too hard in the whole thing. Like, oh, it's the Depression and they're poor, so of course the lighting is going to be terrible. And it's going to be like really drab and always dark out in California. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the what? Like, when he first gets there to the diner and everything it's this horrible overcast day and everything i'm like this is in the hills of los angeles this is not like like it's it's i don't know if you've ever been to la it rains maybe like a couple days a year (laughs) otherwise it's pretty gorgeous oh i uh... it's just it's so weird like all the the things they decide to do with it it's like the lighting can be a bit better but then again, like there are certain scenes, like you know, when it, when he's being a bastard, where it's like, you know what, less light. Let's, do less <laughs> Let's light. have him obscured. That you know what, yeah. I didn't mention it, but oh god, there, yeah, there were so there were too many moments of me seeing Jack Nicholson in some form of undress or in some form of intimacy. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I was just about to say one of the examples in my head of I don't know what's going on because the lighting's bad and it's too blurry is the first sex scene. But I didn't bring it up because I was like, well, I, I guess I didn't really want to see that. But. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, there's just so many scenes where I'm like, I wish I have I have seen far too much of Jack Nicholson now. Like, there's a whole scene. Like, there's a scene where he's it's just like where, you know, Jessica Lange comes out of the, ba- the bathroom and it's him just like laying on his stomach full out, ass out and everything just <laughs> naked on the bed and everything. I'm like. No, <laughs> this is this is unpleasant. How how has Jack Nicholson managed to sexually assault me? <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> stay tuned for 2022 because that is going to be October in the they remade it pinup calendar. <laughs> oh Currently in production. Oh God, who else? Would, who else from our movies would be in that fucking? Uh, <laughs> robocop probably yes yes when he's, he's when he's walking through the water at the end of the original and everything he's constantly naked so yeah. put some clothes <laughs> on that bot please <laughs> of course the secret of nim none of them are wearing pants this is easy <laughs> oh god if we end up doing anything like this i think we're just we've, we've gone down a weird path <laughs> Oh no! Oh. I also don't want to like. I also don't want to have to think about more of the movies that we've seen, like where with potentially you know d- d- unclothed characters. It's like I feel like we're gonna get into some weird zones there. Yeah, maybe we should not do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like well. Oh god, I can't even can't even necessarily think of anything else to say. It's like once you get to that and just seeing Jack Nicholson full buck, it's just kind of like. What else is there to talk about? <laughs> I guess the only other thing I was going to say is that the 81 version of The Postman Always Rings Twice, I will say it because I don't think we've said the title of the movie in like 40 minutes. Not that people would yeah, have forgotten, it's, it's just strange, but it's also long. Um, it's a mouthful. Yeah. So the 81 version has, it has some neat moments and it has uh, decent portrayals and actors and I don't know the circus thing. I think I've come around on it too. I think it's funny, but yeah, exactly. That, like like I said, that's kind of one of the reasons I ca- it elevated itself in my mind. But I can't say I enjoyed watching it, which is usually my barometer for these. Um, yeah, the forty six one did keep my attention the whole time, and like you said, maybe it's because they're identical. But I think that I don't know the fact that it was more violent and that Nicholson creep me out that i was just not having it so i mean the 46 one already wins by default but i don't want to sell it short because good lighting i like lana turner a lot um alan reed is in there distracting me uh and it's a genuinely well fleshed out story i think so yeah yeah 
I mean, like, it's it's kind of obvious. Like, I'm in relatively the same boat. I will say it was close for me. I think ultimately, you know, 81, it was at least well made. Oh, like, yeah. It definitely, definitely. Like, it definitely brought the story across it was meaning to do. Like, it was definitely meant to be darker and everything. Um, but just, like, it's difficult. I feel like if I had seen the 81 version originally, like, if I, if I had seen that one first... At the end of the movie, I probably just would have been like, what was the fucking point of watching that? <laughs> just watch these terrible people do terrible things. Now one person's dead. Whereas at least in the original one, it seemed like they were kind of going towards a, at least attempting towards a moral, even if it was kind of ha- ham handed, just like, you know, just like the idea of like, you, you know, you can't escape fate and that sort of thing. Or just like escape consequences, at least. Mm. Um, I will say that maybe seeing, maybe you are onto something there and that seeing the 81 version second. Maybe that's why I like the ending more. Maybe if I had seen it first, I would like the 46 one more. Because then I'd be yeah. like, oh, something happens at the end. But I guess I guess maybe the juxtaposition in the order that I watched it made me appreciate what Jack Nicholson eventually has to suffer through. I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I, I get what you mean. It's Yeah, it's just... It's definitely more, it's better structured and the acting, well, maybe not the acting, but the overall characters I just prefer for the 46 one, you know. The acting was good. I still think Jessica Lang was like, I will say, you know, I definitely like Jessica Lang leagues above basically anyone else. Um, But beyond that, yeah, it's like, I genuinely just at the end of the 81 one, I was just like, fucking, I'm glad it's done. Which is a telltale sign not great <laughs> when i am thankful for it to be over that's i don't know five out of ten six out of yeah. ten <laughs> should also should also say for the entire like elaboration on the uh side lover shtick with the circus and everything i these movies are almost identical in length i think the 81 version yeah. is only like nine or ten minutes longer uh, just at two hours so yeah and even considering all the times they added in you know nicholson sex exactly way more sex <sighs> god that, it, yeah <laughs> gonna have a lot of gonna have a lot of images in my brain it's gonna be a t- it's gonna take a while to scrub clean <laughs> oh my god i did love them both though i can't say i disliked I, I can't necessarily say I disliked 81 really like if I got right down to it it's like I, I I'm thankful that I have seen it I would not watch it again and it was definitely more draining than invigorating but a, movie, a movie's allowed to do okay. that I think that's a good way to put um, it because I, I yeah I, I think it's I think it's a good movie with a good story but I cannot say that I liked it I, I personally yeah. can't say that I liked it I can't say that I disliked it I'll at least say that it's like, it's it's just, it's difficult to sit through. That's the most I'll say. Which, again, a movie doesn't necessarily have to be simple to sit through. Oh, but good lord above. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've had enough, I've seen enough Jack Nicholson to last a lifetime. <laughs> uh, so I guess we're, we're, on con- we're in consensus once again for this one. Yes, Jack, Jack Nicholson has ruined our lives. <laughs> uh, or at least mine. So, um... Do you have any suggestions this time around? Uh, actually, kind of a couple. All right, cool. Um, for the original, at the very least, um, I kind of like, I still haven't seen it, but apparently Bonnie and Clyde is a kind of a good, like, you know, it's like, like kind of dr- like romantic thriller kind of thing like that, where like between the two main characters and like committing crime and that sort of shit. Um, I want to see it. Apparently it's, pre- it's pretty amazing. Um, that and another um, movie apparently by uh, Tay Gamet, um, Double Indemnity, was actually very similar. Mm-hmm. Which I think actually came out before this. As far as the 81 version, I'm honestly not too sure. You had, you had brought up one... Oh, yeah, fucking um, uh, Dustin Hoffman's uh, Death, uh, Death of a Salesman. Oh, that's, yeah, that... Yes. That, that's a fa- fantastic movie. Um honestly it's it's fantastic or even like seeing that anyone should see like the play if they can it's it's the best um obviously depressing but you know it's 
good. It's it's about the the depression for God's sake. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the only one I can really think of off the top of my head. Okay, for the eighty one version at least. Um, so I just have a couple, just sort of related. Um, so for so the the. The 81 version was directed by Bob Raffleson? Raffleson? One of those. And... I think Raffle. Raffle? Okay. So, um... He... Actually <laughs> directed and produced a lot of different films. The, specifically what I pulled is he produced both... Both? He produced both The Last Picture Show and Easy Rider. Um... Very interesting... Um, both of those are movies, so uh, go out and see those. But another thing that bear, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, no, no, I just, I just had to. Go oh, okay, sorry. no problem. <laughs> um, but another thing I full- pulled was uh, Tay Garnet, uh, or Gamut, or whatever. I have it typed up as Garnet, but you've been saying Gamut, so it's one of those. Um, he actually directed a movie that we can cover in the future as an episode. Uh, that oh god, <laughs> that being uh, an adaptation of a Mark Twain story, uh, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, starring Bing Crosby and Cedric Hardwick. So, um, god, that's a that was a three hit combo right there, dude. Good <laughs> lord. <laughs> Into, like Mark Twain, that whole mess of a title, Bing Crosby. Holy crap. <laughs> oh, which is hilarious. I cannot say that I've seen that. I'm familiar with the title, but I just saw that and I was like, you know what? Go out and watch that just for the title <laughs> and maybe we'll do an episode on it in 2022. Who knows? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> That's such God, yeah. I'm I'm reeling from that one. Good lord, man. Oh, but that's all I have for suggestions. Uh, any final thoughts gotcha. on anything before I go into the socials? Uh, not in particular, other than Mr. Ian Matthew. Thank you for suggesting this, but also fuck you for making me look at Jack Nicholson this much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that. You're you're a lad. I Thank love you. you, Ian. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. oh, God. So, uh, gonna have to watch. Gonna have to watch so many other movies to get that out of my brain. <laughs> um. So I guess I'll just go into socials then. It sounds like we're about there. Um. I'd say so. So, uh, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast and like us and leave reviews on any of your podcasting platforms. We are on pretty much all of them. Uh, iTunes or Apple Podcasts, whatever the hell you want to call it. Google Play, Spreaker, Podbay, Podomatic, uh, Stitcher. Um, YouTube, I always forget to mention YouTube, but there is a YouTube channel. Uh, don't expect any video. <laughs> it's just the audio, but plenty of people put their podcasts on YouTube. Um, yeah, got to spread around a bit. Yeah. And yeah. And just look us up on any of those. They remade it as the podcast name, but of course, Anchor is our host. Are our hosts? Thank you very much, Anchor. Uh, Go ahead and send an email to theyremadeit at gmail.com if you have any suggestions. We have already done, uh, technically we've done two, because we got a list of one like a, a couple days before we were filming one of the ones on the list. So, you know, we, uh, and there's another one I think that I put in my back pocket. So, uh, you know, send us suggestions if you have any, or, you know, comments, uh, criticisms, anything that you want. It'll go into the inbox, and I will definitely read it. And obviously, you know, and obviously, if you leave a handle for us and and everything, we'll give you a good, decent shout out as we've given to Ian and everything. Yeah, of course, uh, unless you say not to. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll, we'll like we will respect privacy. We're not, I, I don't know, what's a contemporary thing to say that doesn't respect privacy? Google, and, p- sure, pretty yeah. much any. Say, that's any a safe one. Tech. Yeah. Insert tech company here for whatever year you're watching. <laughs> as if, as again, as if we did not hard date this at the beginning. Just know we will respect your privacy. Yes, I made sure to ask him before we said his name and everything. I wanted to make sure it was fine. But um, yep, yeah. So uh, go ahead and do that. And also at it remade on Twitter and they remade it at Instagram. 
where I post updates to the podcast uh, when it goes live, posters for things that we have suggested or that we've been watching recently, and uh, little full circle diagrams that I put together for people we have covered on the show. Uh, and that's a lot of fun. And of course, you know, you can uh, go leave comments on those because we actually, we changed uh, we changed an episode based on an Instagram suggestion as well. So you can suggest through anything uh, that we yeah. have. Uh, we will bend to anyone's will. <laughs> especially for things that I have not seen before. Um, yes. Because I, I much Would- enjoy that. Which, as the show goes on, is numbering, numbering smaller and smaller, but Hollywood keeps chunking them out. So yeah, so it never ceases. Um, yeah, t- yeah. Talk about no exit. <laughs> <laughs> Two characters in search of an exit. <laughs> Hell is other movies. <laughs> oh, but that—that's it that's for the socials. Yep, yeah, I think it kind of wraps us a bit can't really think of anything else that might be said i mean so I, can't I think either. i think i've gotten everything out of my system i possibly could for these two movies me too more than i well i think i had to get it out or else it would have festered in my brain yeah it'll it'll continue to fester in mine my god god will has cursed me with a visual memory i think talking about fanboys may have been getting more off my chest honestly <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, I do love that this show, essentially, the beginning of it has basically become our personal therapy sessions. <laughs> <laughs> Much it's needed. Like, you, know what, you know what I really hate about modern media? I hate, hate, hate Ernest Klein stuff. Listeners to the podcast, please send me links to more Ernest Klein things <laughs> for me to consume. <laughs> Yeah, Jake, at one point I'm going to have to like sit you down and like ask if you're doing okay. Because <laughs> like, there's a certain point where it goes from, oh, you know, he's just like watching these things for like, you know, schadenfreude for himself or whatever. But there's a certain point I have to go, okay, this might register as self-harm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no Jack Kevorkian. <laughs> oh, I think that's about as good as we can leave it. Yeah, wait, I can't do any better than that. <laughs> I think that's our peak. <laughs> As always, I am your host, Stuart. And I'm your host, Jacob. (laughs) And thank you so much for listening. Good night. just you and me. What are you talking about? I'm tired of what's right and wrong. <laughs>